All right, today we're going to finish up chapter four. We're going to do sections five and six, which are rational functions and then polynomial and rational inequalities. So first off, let's look at rational. Rational functions. are simply fractions. So if we have a polynomial that's made up of two polynomials, that's a rational function. Let's make it r instead of p. So r of x equals f of x over g of x. The only stipulation we have, because it's a fraction, is that g of x cannot equal 0. And that's going to be important in a little bit. So we're going to look at points that where our function is 0 on the bottom. So with fractions, both the numerator and the denominator both tell us something. When the numerator, which is f of x, when it equals 0, that, give you, that gives you the x-intercepts. When you put 0 in place of x, that gives you the y-intercept. And when, when the denominator, g of x, when it equals 0, tells us where the function is undefined. Because you cannot have zero on the bottom. So that's the outline of what we're going to talk about this morning. We've talked about two rational functions already in the library of functions. The first one was 1 over x. And the second one was 1 over x squared. What we know so far, looking at this, boy, we just put up there. The numerator in this case can never equals zero. So we have no x-intercepts. So this one has no x-intercepts. Has no y-intercepts, because if we take the function and put zero in place of x, we get one over zero. So there's no x-intercepts, no y-intercepts. And what we do know that 
as x goes to infinity. one over x gets smaller. The bigger the bottom, the smaller the number becomes, so it gets closer to zero. As x goes to negative infinity, one over x also goes to zero. Because again, the, the bigger the bottom number is, the smaller the fraction is. Since we can't have zero in the bottom, what happens as x goes to zero from the left? That means As x's get closer to zero, what happens to one over x? So if it goes from negative 10 to negative five, it's getting bigger. Negative one, it's getting much bigger. At negative a half, it's two. Negative 10th, it's 10. So what this graph looks like, is like this. So as x goes to zero from the left, one over x goes to negative infinity. And this side, as x goes to negative infinity, it gets closer and closer and closer to zero, it gets closer to zero. Likewise, here on, on the positive side, as x goes to positive infinity, it gets closer to zero. As x gets closer to zero, as x gets closer to zero from the right, one over x goes to positive infinity, because we're only putting positive numbers in there. So we see two things here. It never crosses the x-axis, and it never crosses the y-axis. How about this one? As x goes to zero from the right, what happens with this? As we use numbers going this way, what happens to one over two squared? It's much bigger, much faster. So it goes to positive infinity. It keeps on going higher there. Uh, Does anybody not see why? Yes. So let's look at, we're going, for, we're going to go from one, let's say this is one. Then we'll go to one half and then one fourth. Now, these are my x values, one over x. When one over one, it equals one. One over one half, that's a fraction over a fraction. So we take the top fraction, leave it alone, and flip the bottom. One half now becomes two. One over one fourth, one over one times four over one is four. So the bigger fraction we have on the bottom, 
we flip it and it becomes bigger. So if we go to one over 100th, then we'll go to 100. So the closer we get to zero, the fraction, the bigger the number becomes because we flip the bottom. And as x goes to infinity, 1 over x squared, because it gets bigger, goes to 0. So that's the positive side. What happens on the negative side? What happens as x goes to zero, bless you, from the left? What if we put negative values in there? Whenever you square a negative, what happens? It becomes positive. So that one goes to positive infinity also. So one over x squared goes to positive infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, 1 over x squared goes to 0. Now, what does it mean when I say goes to 0? What value are these y values? Because at this one, we have that equals 2, that equals, and then 1, and then closer and closer and closer. Does it ever cross that axis? No, what's the y value at that point there? Zero, so that's what happens here. One over two, one over x squared goes to y equals zero. That's what it's talking about. These are what we call asymptotes. The lines that the graph does not cross are called asymptotes. A line that the function approaches but doesn't cross. There are some exceptions about the doesn't cross we'll talk about. We have three types of asymptotes. One is the vertical asymptote. which I'm going to call VA from now on. It is never crossed. The second Is a horizontal asymptote. Which I'll call HA from now on. But can be crossed. If the graph crosses a horizontal asymptote, then as soon as it crosses it, it has to approach the asymptote again. So in other words, it doesn't cross it and keep on going away. It crosses it and goes back to the asymptote, approaching it. And then the third type is called an oblique asymptote. It's a slant, yes. 
which I'll call OA. And it can be crossed. Same thing. If the graph crosses it, then it has to go back and towards and get very close to that asymptote. In other words, what that means, if I have a horizontal asymptote and the graph crosses it, so as soon as it crosses it, it has to go back towards it. So same with an oblique asymptote. These asymptotes give us the shape now of what our graph may start looking like. Because it tells us where it has to fit. It gives us the parameters of our graph. And for example, like these. One over X. It can't cross the where X is zero. It can't cross that. And there is no horizontal asymptote. One over X squared, we just did that. And more complex rational equations. Notice you see, you'll see here that there's an imaginary line here and an imaginary line here that the graph doesn't cross. And there's one right here. That's the vertical asymptote. The horizontal asymptote is right here, is zero in this case. And this one is right at one. And this one is at one also. This one has a vertical asymptote and it has an oblique asymptote. That's what we're going to find today. Example one. F of X is equal to one over X minus three. I have a domain of our function. The domain deals with which values? X values. So what we're looking for is what X values can we use in our function? To find the domain, set the denominator equal to zero. Solve for X. Any value X that makes the denominator equal zero cannot be used. So in our example, our denominator is x minus three. Set that equal to zero. Solve for x. And that's the only x value we cannot use. So our domain, if you think about it, if the only number we can't use is three, then our domain goes from negative infinity to positive three, and then from three 
to positive infinity. That's our domain. Because again, we cannot have zero on the bottom. The only place is zero is at three. So we can use anything else except that. This is only for the domain. The pictures I showed you at the beginning. This is example two. We had one over X. One over X squared. X minus three over X squared plus X minus two. Two X plus five over two X minus six. E is x squared plus 2x minus 3, x squared minus x minus 2. Negative x squared, x plus 1. So those, those were the equations from each of our graphs here. We're going to look for the vertical asymptotes. Or actually, no, we're going to find the domain, which will also So in the first one, set the bottom equal to zero. So that's the only place, that's the only number we can't use. So our domain is from negative infinity to zero, union with zero to positive infinity. That's our domain. The next one, so take the bottom, set it equal to zero and solve for X, square root both sides, square root of zero is zero. So it's the same thing. The only one we can't use is zero. So we'll go from negative infinity to zero then zero to positive infinity. Ah, good question. Well, first off, we know that we can't use zero. So there has to be an open circle. Since it's an open circle, there has to be a parenthesis. Bracket means we can include it. And we can't use zero inside the bottom. So the domain is always parentheses. For the uh, for the bottom number, what do you think we do this next one? Since it's a trinomial quadratic equation, factor it out if we can. If not, then use use the quadratic formula. So we have x and x, opposite signs, because it's minus, and the bigger number gets a plus. So one, take one times two. What times what gives us two? When we subtract them, we get one. Two and one, two minus one, very good. And the bigger number gets a plus. So it's plus two, Minus one. Set both of those equal to zero. We get 
x equals negative 2 and x equals positive 1. Those are the numbers we cannot use. So we cannot use negative 2 and we cannot use negative 1. So our domain is from negative infinity to negative 2, parenthesis, union, negative 2 to 1, union, 1 to infinity. D, 2x minus 6 equals 0, 2x equals 6, divided by 2, x equals 3. So we cannot use a 3. In our domain. So our domain goes from negative infinity to 3, union 3 to positive infinity. So when, actually, when, when you're finding the domain for where bottom of our denominator, anywhere you see these open circles, that's where we put our unions. All right. Same thing in the next one. Factor out the denominator. We got x and x. Opposite signs. There's second signs of minus. And the bigger number gets a negative. So the bigger number goes there. Take the first and last terms. So 1 times 2 is 2. What times what equals 2? When we subtract them, we get the middle coefficient, one, two and one. And the bigger number gets the negative, so two and one. Set those equal to zero, we get negative one and two. Those are the ones we cannot use. These are our U's. So we're going from negative infinity to negative 1. Union negative 1 to 2. Union 2 to infinity. And the last one, we can't use negative one. So we go from negative infinity to negative one, union negative one to infinity. So far, so good. Now, all of those X's that we can't use, those are called vertical asymptotes.
the, the X's that make the denominator equal to zero. Those are my vertical asymptotes. So looking at the graph from example one, we had f of x equals one over x minus three. We actually did this in chapter two, transformations. What is the basic function here? It's one over x, right? The graph of that one looks like this. You notice that it doesn't touch this vertical line here because it can't be zero. X cannot be zero. Then it does what? It goes to the right three spaces. So we have a horizontal shift, three spaces to the right because X, what would make the bottom zero? So we shift it to the right, three spaces, and there's my vertical asymptote. The graph looks the same, it's just been shifted to the right, three spaces. All right, let's look at example three. Find the vertical asymptotes. F of X equals two X minus 11. x squared plus 2x minus 8. h of x equals x squared minus 4x, x cubed minus x. and g of x x minus 2 x cubed minus 5x so those are our vertical asymptotes find the vertical asymptote those are our functions let's find the vertical asymptotes So what do we have to do to the functions? Yes. So the bottom becomes x and x. What times what is eight? When you subtract them, you get two. And they're opposite signs, the bigger number's positive. 4 times 2 is 8, 4 minus 2 is 2. Wait, Because when we do the differences, this number, there has to be more positives than negatives. Because where does the middle number come from? It comes from this number times that number plus this number times that number. So negative 2 plus 4 is positive two. So the, the bigger number has to have that plus in front of it. Then what do we do? 
since the denominator is equal to zero, we get negative four and two. So my vertical asymptotes are at negative four and two. So at negative four and at two, I have vertical lines that the crop that the graph cannot cross. Let's factor out the, the whole equation here. What does the top become? They both have an X in common, so we take out an X. That leaves us X minus four on top. On the bottom, we can take out an X that leaves us X squared minus one. So we have X. And what happens to this? Yes, it's the difference of two squares. So it's x plus one, x minus one. How many solutions are we gonna have there? Three. This one, set them all equal to zero. So we get x equals zero, x equals negative one, and x equals positive one. Those are my vertical asymptotes. So these are the lines and also on that. Those are the lines my graph cannot cross. With this one, there's something special. Because remember, if we look at the very top, that tells us our x-intercepts. Our x-intercepts are gonna be x equals zero and x equals four. But we can't cross zero. We notice that both of these are gonna cancel. Whenever you factor out numerator and denominator, if the number crosses out, that means there's going to be a, a hole there. So whenever x equals zero, put it, remove those guys, put zero in place of that. When x is zero, it's negative four over negative one, which is four. So our x-intercept will not happen. It'll be an open circle there. In other words, there has to be that number removed. It's called a hole. Whenever you can cancel the top and bottom, that value still exists. In other words, this is still an, a vertical asymptote. But when we plug in zero in the remainder of the equation, we get a hole. We'll look at more of those later. Yes, the domain, uh, the restriction, yes, because that's still on the bottom of the, of the original equation. I cannot use zero, I cannot, cannot use negative one, and I cannot use positive one. Those are still my asymptotes, my vertical asymptotes. And the last one, 
I could take out an x, which gives me x squared minus 5. So I have x equals 0, x squared minus 5 equals 0, x squared equals 5, square root both sides, x equals plus or minus square root of 5. So we're going to have three. We're going to have three vertis, uh, vertical asymptotes. Zero, positive radical five, negative radical five. So radical negative radical five is just a little bit bigger than negative two. At, and just a little bit bigger than positive two, and at the so these are my vertical asymptotes where my graph cannot cross. Okay, so vertical asymptotes are pretty easy to find. Take the bottom set equals zero, and those are your asymptotes. What about horizontal asymptotes? No, you can only have one or the other. Because they're both, they both rely on the same concept, except the, the slant asymptote is an exception to the rule. So in horizontal asymptotes, we have a rational polynomial. A n x n a n minus one x n minus one a one x a zero. On the bottom we have b n x n b n minus one no, m x m minus one dot 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 b1, x, b0. So you have any polynomial on top, any polynomial on the bottom. The important part of any polynomial is the leading term. The leading term has the most weight. It influences the most. That's what we call it the leading term. So since all we have to, since it's the leading term, that's what we have to pay attention to. You notice the top is x to the power n, bottom is x to the power m. The leading term is the most powerful in that polynomial. It has the same relationship here. Whichever exponent is bigger carries more weight. That's why for horizontal asymptotes, if the exponent on top is bigger than the exponent on the bottom, Then the horizontal asymptote does not exist. B and E. Okay. 
If the one exponent on top is bigger than the exponent on the bottom, it actually goes to infinity. That's why it doesn't exist. Because infinity is not a number. Let me show you an example of what I mean. 2x to the fifth divided by 3x to the third. These are my leading terms. When we simplify these, on top we have 5x's. On the bottom we have 3x's. So we can cancel out three of them. The reason the leading terms are important is because we're always going to be looking for as x goes to positive infinity, what is happening. When x becomes larger, where does this equation go to? It goes to infinity. So no matter what x you put in there, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That's why if the top is bigger than the bottom, there is no horizontal asymptote. If the top is equal to the bottom, then the horizontal asymptote is simply the coefficients. Two x to the fifth over three x to the fifth. The x to the fifths cancel we're left with 2 over 3. Then if the top is smaller than the bottom, the horizontal asymptote equals 0. Remember, the vertical asymptote goes through the x-axis. Horizontal asymptotes go through the y-axis. So if the horizontal asymptote is zero, that means it's the x-axis. Let's think about it. Where is y equals zero? Right there, which is the x-axis. So if, if the top is smaller than the bottom, Three of them cancel, so we subtract three. As x goes to infinity, the bottom gets bigger, the number gets smaller, so it equals zero. So let's go look at back at example two again. What is our vertical asymptote? And what is our horizontal asymptote? What's our horizontal asymptote? Our vertical asymptote. What's that? How do you find the vertical asymptote? Set the bottom equals zero. Set that equals zero, you get three. So the vertical asymptote is at x equals three. How about the horizontal asymptote? Remember, look at the 
Look at where, where are the most X's? At the bottom. So this one has more X's on top. This one has same number of X's. And this one has more X's on the bottom. So where are more X's, top or bottom? On the bottom. So the horizontal asymptote is zero. Yeah, because this is the easiest way to do it. I'm not going to show you the whole mathematical way where I divide each term by the largest exponent. That just a lot of extra work. It does the same thing. Example four. F of X equals negative seven X to the fourth minus 10 X squared plus one. 11 x to the fourth plus x minus two. Find the horizontal asymptote. Okay, here's the easy way. You don't have to look at your notes. Horizontal asymptote. All we have to do is look at leading coefficient, leading term. Get rid of everything else. Now, cancel the x's. How many were, who has more x's? They both cancel out. So what are you left with? How would you find the vertical asymptote? Set them, who, who's them? Mm -hmm. Set the bottom equals zero. In this case, you'd have to use uh, 22, 72, no. We have to use a quadratic formula. You'd use the quadratic formula and whatever you'd get, those would be your vertical asymptotes. Example five, find the horizontal asymptote of this one. 2x plus three over x cubed minus 2x squared plus four. So the horizontal asymptote here would be Remember, all you have to look at, who has more X's, top or bottom? The bottom. So if the bottom has more X's, what's the horizontal asymptote? It's zero. And that's all you have to do is look back at the sheet that we just talked about right here. Just look at these rules here for horizontal asymptotes. If there's more X's on top, there's no asymptote. If it's the same, it's the coefficients. If there's more on the bottom, it's zero. If there's more on the bottom, it's zero. Exception to the rule. Which rule? The first one.
That's the first of the rules for horizontal asymptotes. If the top is bigger than the bottom, then the horizontal does not exist. The exception to the rule is, except if N is equal to M plus one, except if the top exponent is bigger than the bottom by one. If it's bigger than the bottom by one, then we have an oblique or slant asymptote. Because originally, this would have said there's no horizontal asymptote because there's more on top than the bottom. But if you cancel these, how many more x's do you have and where? On where? On top. There's five of them on the top. You cancel four of them. So you subtract four. You're left with one. So whenever you have one more on top than the bottom, if we do long division, we're going to always end up with a linear equation. So to find the oblique asymptote, Do long division and remove any remainder. An oblique asymptote is going to look like something like that. It's a slant. It's going to be a linear equation. So it's we know how to graph those already. Let's look at example eight. Or is it eight? Or do we have another one? No, seven. We're, we're six. Let's do six first. Graph this equation. F of x equals 2x squared plus 1 over x squared. Steps one, find the vertical asymptote, find the horizontal or oblique asymptote, find x intercepts. Find the y intercept. and some points. So we have 
2x squared plus 1 over x squared. What is my vertical asymptote? Zero. Because we, we take the bottom, set it equal to zero, we get x equals zero. So our vertical asymptote is... Now, if the vertical asymptote is zero, where is that situated? Yeah, that's the y-axis. So we can't cross the y-axis. In other words, let's think about it. If you put zero in there, we can't have a y-intercept. What's the horizontal asymptote? Two, because if we cancel the x squareds, we only have two. What's our x-intercept? Sure. No, because it sounded like a question. How do you find the x-intercept? No, set the top equal to zero. The only way a fraction can equal zero is if the top is equal to zero. So we set top equal to zero and try to solve it. So subtract one, two x squared equals negative one, divided by two, x squared equals negative one half. And we see what's gonna happen. Okay, well, square root both sides. What's going to happen there? Can I have a negative side there? So we have imaginary numbers. So there's no x-intercepts. How do we find the y-intercept? Nope. From chapter one, how do we find the y-intercept? Set x equals zero and solve. So we have two times zero squared plus one over zero squared. We can't do that because you can't have a zero on the bottom. So there's no y-intercept. So let's put all that stuff together. We have a vertical asymptote equals zero. Horizontal asymptote equals two. No x or y intercept. One, two. So the horizontal asymptote is there. The vertical asymptote is here. So step five says, find some points. Our function was two X squared plus one over X squared. So let's take some negative numbers, negative two, negative one and some positive numbers. Let's see what happens. Oop, one and two. When X is negative two, we've got two times negative two squared plus one over negative two squared. Two times four plus one over four. So it's nine over four. Nine over four is two and one fourth. So it's at one fourth. At negative one, two times negative one squared plus one over negative one squared. Negative one squared is one, two plus one is three over one, so it's three.
Same thing at one and two. So what we see is our graph's gonna look like this. The closer we get to the zero, the bigger our number becomes. The farther we get from it, the closer it gets to zero. So that's how we start looking at these functions and we know where it can and can't cross. Let's look at example seven. f of x equals 2x squared minus 3x minus 1 over x minus 2. Find all asymptotes. So we have a vertical asymptote a horizontal asymptote, or an oblique asymptote. Vertical asymptote. Whenever you have a rational expression, you always have a, a vertical asymptote. What is our vertical asymptote? Now, set take the bottom, set it equal to zero. So that's my vertical asymptote. Now, for the for the horizontal asymptote, the rule is still true. If there's more X is on top than the bottom, we will not have a horizontal asymptote. There is more X's on top than the bottom. This one has two, this one only has one. So there's no horizontal. Do we have an oblique asymptote? Yes, because the top is bigger than the bottom by one. So we have an oblique asymptote. The way we find the oblique asymptote is we have to do division. You could also, since the denominator is x plus or minus a, you could have done synthetic division, but well. So what times x gives me 2x squared? 2x. 2x times x is 2x squared. Positive times negative is negative. 2x times 2 is 4x. Change the signs and add. 4 minus 3 is x minus 1. What times x gives me x? Positive one, very good. Positive one times x is x. Positive one times negative two is negative two. Change the signs and add. This is the only part you'll keep. Get rid of the remainder. That's the only part you'll keep. So those are our asymptotes. Let's see how they look on our graph. So our vertical asymptote is at two. 
So there's our vertical asymptote. That's our vertical asymptote. The oblique asymptote is the equation 2x plus 1. In chapter 1, this is the y equals mx plus b. We have a y-intercept at 1. The slope is 2 over 1, up 2 over 1. So this is our oblique asymptote. Whenever you have an oblique asymptote, the graph is either going to be inside these areas here, or it's going to be on the outside. That's why you have to pick a point and find out. So if we used, if we use zero and plug it into our equation, we have two times zero squared, three times zero minus one, zero minus two. So that's gone, that's gone. So negative one over negative two, which is positive one half. So we have a y-intercept there. That'll tell us that our graph will look something like this. Because since that point exists and it's inside that V, then the rest of the graph has to fit there. We can also figure it out because the numerator is gonna give us two x-intercepts. Any questions so far? No. Yeah, that doesn't do any good for us because all we need is a, we need a linear equation. The remainder doesn't do anything for us. Just get rid of it, just delete it. <laughs> delete it, no, erase it, get rid of it. Example eight. f of x equals 2x plus 3, 3x squared plus 7x minus 6. Graph. Remember, to graph, You need x-intercept, the y-intercept, the vertical asymptote, horizontal asymptote, or oblique asymptote, and some points. Okay, first thing to look at. X-intercepts, how do you find that? No. Set the top equal to zero. Because <laughs> for the X-intercept, you have to set the equation equal to zero. The only way it could be zero is the top zero. <laughs> And we get x equals negative three over two. <coughs> That's our x intercept. The y intercept. Set x equal to zero, so we have two times zero plus three. Three times zero 
seven times zero minus six, <clears throat> and zero, zero, zero. So you get three over a negative six, which is negative one half. <clears throat> so the y intercept that negative one half. Third, the vertical asymptote. The vertical asymptote is when you set the bottom equal to zero. You could either use the quadratic formula or see if you can factor it. Let's. So whenever you have a non one coefficient, put that in both places. The second signs are minus, so they're opposite signs. The bigger one is positive. If it's, how do we know, okay, ask you a question. How do we know it's factorable? If we take the first and last term, three times six equals 18. What times what equals 18 that when you subtract them, you get seven? Nine and two, nine minus two. Because of that, you know it's factorable. If it's not, then you can use a quadratic formula and you get still get the same answers. So the answer is nine and two. The bigger number is positive, so it's nine and two. Then can you factor anything out of these equations? Take out a three of the first one, you get x plus three, and nothing out of the second one. Whatever you factored out, remove. So there's your factor for that equation. Set them equal to zero. And we get our x-intercepts. I mean, our vertical asymptotes. Negative three. And then positive two over three. Those are my vertical asymptotes. Do we have a horizontal asymptote? Yes, and it would be no. Where are there more X's, top or bottom? Zero. There are more, zero. There are more X's on the bottom. If there's more X's on the bottom, then the horizontal asymptote is zero. Just think about it. Again, forget everything else other than the leading terms. I have x here and I have two x here. I can cancel one of the x's. I have more x's now. As x goes to infinity, the answer goes to zero. So there's everything we need to graph our equation so far. So the x-intercept. at negative one, one half. The y-intercept is at one half, negative one half. Vertical asymptote is at negative three and two thirds. And the horizontal asymptote is at zero.
So the x-intercept is at negative one and one half. The y-intercept is at negative half. The vertical asymptote is at three, or negative three. That's a vertical asymptote. And at two thirds, which is approximately there. And the A horizontal asymptote is at zero. Notice here, a horizontal asymptote is zero is a x-axis, but yet we have an x-intercept. You can cross the horizontal or oblique asymptotes, but it has to approach an asymptote as soon as it does that. So we need some points. Well, okay, here's the first question I have y'all. Are there any x-intercepts on the left of this vertical asymptote? Are there any x-intercepts? Besides negative one and one half. No, so that, that means the graph is either above it or below it. And these are our asymptotes. So it's either going to be like this or it's going to be like this. Same thing over here. There's no x-intercepts. So it's either going to be like this or it's going to be like this. So let's see. Let's pick negative four and plug that into our equation. So we have, so it was two x plus three, three x squared plus seven x minus six. So at this side, we have two times negative four plus three, three negative four squared, seven times negative four minus six. Negative eight, plus three, three times 16, minus 28, minus six. Negative five, 48, minus 34. So it's gonna be negative. So whatever point we're looking for, we know it's going to be negative. So it will look like this on this side. And same thing on the right-hand side here. Let's pick two. Two times two plus three. Three times two squared plus seven times two minus six, four plus three, three times four plus 14 minus six, 12 plus 14 minus six, so it's 26. It's gonna be seven over 20, so it's gonna be positive. So that's gonna be up there. We know we have a y-intercept at negative one-half and the x-intercept at one and one-half. If we take the number negative two and plug it in there, if we get a positive answer, that means the graph will look something like this. If we don't, then it'll be like that. So let's look at negative two. 2 times negative 2 plus 3, 3 negative 2 squared, 7 times negative 2, 
negative four plus three. Three times positive four minus 14 minus six. Negative one. 12 minus 20. So it's positive one eight. So our graph over here will look something like this. Because it has to cross through the y-intercept and the x-intercept, and this one's positive, so it keeps on going up. Any questions about this process? Once you find the asymptotes and you find the intercepts, if it's on the outer points, it's nine times out of nine, it's always going to be either going to be above the x-axis or below the x-axis. Since there's no x-intercepts. The only problem comes in what happens in the middle. Let's do another one. Let's do example nine. We got x squared minus one over x squared plus x minus six. Graph, remember, we need x intercepts, y intercepts, vertical asymptote, horizontal asymptote, or vert oblique asymptote. and points. So the first one, x-intercept. What did you get for the x-intercept? One. No. What did you get? One. Right. Take the top. Set it equal to zero. You can either make it difference of two squares. So x equals plus or minus one. Those are my x-intercepts. The y-intercept. The y-intercept is always the constants. So you have negative one over negative six, which is one sixth. That's the y-intercept. The vertical asymptote. Set the bottom equal to zero. And solve. Opposite signs. Bigger ones positive. What times what is six? When you subtract them, you get one. Three and two. So my vertical asymptotes are at negative three and positive two. For the y-intercept, if you set x equal to zero, all the x's are gone. All you have left is a constant. Negative one over negative six. <laughs> Light clicked on. Is, is the yeah, I, I have y set x equal to zero and solve for y. So, words, if you set x equal to zero, all the x's are gone. You're only left with the constant. And then four, the horizontal asymptote. Mm -hmm. One. Look at the leading terms. X squared over X squared. They're the same. What does your sheet say if they're the same? 
it equals the coefficients, one over one, which is one. No, there's only, you only look at the leading terms. There's two on top, two on the bottom. So with this, let's look at our graph. We have one, two, three. When we say more X's, we don't mean the number of X's. We mean the X's and the exponents. So my X intercepts were at negative one and one. And the Y intercept was at one sixth. Vertical asymptote is at negative three and two. Horizontal asymptote is at one. Now, since the middle, it already gave us the shape. You can't cross the horizontal last, I mean, you can, but it's typically not, since you have both of these here, it continues that same shape. Now we got to look at, is it going to be above or below the horizontal asymptote? Pick a number like three and see where it's situated. So we have three squared minus one, three squared plus three minus six, nine minus one, nine plus three minus six, Eight over six, which is four thirds, which is positive, which means this side is going to look like this. This point here is going to be pretty important. And likewise, if we use Negative one, two, three. We put negative four inside there. Negative four squared minus one. Negative four squared plus negative four minus six. 16 minus one. 16 minus 10. 15 over six. Five halves. So it'll look like this also. Now, look at our equation. To be safe, to see whether the function crosses your horizontal asymptote, set your equation equal to the horizontal asymptote. Set f of x equal to your horizontal asymptote. This will tell you if your graph crosses the horizontal asymptote and where. So we multiply both sides by x squared minus x minus 6. Subtract x squared from both sides. Add 6. Minus it's plus x. So x is equal to 5. So when x is equal to 5, 
y is equal to one. So the graph will cross the horizontal asymptote there and then we'll go quickly back up to the horizontal asymptote. So it is possible for your function to cross the horizontal asymptote. Set your function equal to the horizontal asymptote and then solve. That's gonna be the point of crossing. So when x equals five, y equals one. So it is possible for your function to cross the x asymptote. I mean the horizontal asymptote. What are you typing? You're doing your work. Yeah. Well, see, and this is the whole reason I, I record this stuff so that I can send it to y'all and that we don't spend too much time to try to copy everything down. Okay. Yeah, so here's where we, we plugged in this value to see if it's above or below the x-axis. Since it's positive, I mean, the horizontal asymptote. We know our graph is above because this one's positive. That's, that, that's what this one was about. This one, same thing at negative four. The function was above the horizontal asymptote, so we knew what it's at. This one, I took the function, set it equal to my horizontal asymptote to see where it crosses. Let's look at holes now. G of X equals X minus two over x squared minus x minus two. Graph. because we're running out of time. How do I find my x-intercept? Set the top equal to zero. So the x-intercept is two. The y-intercept, only look at the constants. On your equation, only look at the constants for the y-intercept, because all the x's are gone, they're zero. Vertical asymptote. Take the bottom, set it equal to zero. Opposite signs, the bigger number is negative. So two and one. Those are my vertical asymptotes. My vertical as horizontal asymptote is zero.
So we have an x-intercept at 2. We have a y-intercept at 1. Vertical asymptotes at negative 1 and positive 2. Uh-oh, that's going to give us a problem. And the so there's a problem here. Why is this there? Because what do we forget to do? Our first step up here. We didn't factor the bottom. We got x plus 1, x minus 2. The x minus 2s cancel. So our re the graph of our equation is that. In other words, we only have one vertical asymptote. We only have one vertical asymptote. We use this vertical asymptote you plug that into what's left of our equation. So at two we have a hole at one-third. So our graph is going to look like this. Because the graph itself is 1 over x plus 1, it's a horizontal shift 1 to the left. So it's 1 over x. But there's a hole. Instead of this being an asymptote, it's now a hole. So what did that example just show us? If we can cancel something from top and bottom, if we can cancel something from top and bottom, that vertical asymptote disappears. It now becomes a hole. You take that value, 2, and plug it into here. And that tells you what's the location of your hole. Hole is at two, positive one third. Let's do one more, then we'll call it a day. We'll finish up chapter four tomorrow and start chapter five. Numerator is negative 2x squared minus x plus 15. So we need x-intercept, y-intercept, or not vertical asymptote. horizontal or oblique asymptote and points.
EP6 print of passes stuck. So the first one. Before we do anything, let's go ahead and factor both of these. We can factor out a negative out of the top, which gives us 2x squared plus x minus 15. Let's factor out the top and the bottom. We know they're factorable because 2 times 15 is 30. And we know what two numbers multiplied equal 30. That when we subtract them, we'll get 1. We got 2x plus and 2x minus. So 2 times 15 is 30. What times what is 30? When you subtract them, you get 1. 6 and 5. And the bigger number gets that. So 6 and 5. x plus. What times what is 12? When you subtract them, you get 1. So 4 is there. Now on the top, can we factor anything out of those parentheses? Any, anything out of the first? A two, so it gives us x plus three, two x minus five. We remove that one, but we factor it out. So those are our factors. We see that there's a similar term on top and bottom, x plus 3. We cancel that, which means we're going to have a whole. We will have a whole at x equals negative 3. So our equation if we plug in negative 3 inside here we'll find our y component of our whole So it's going to be negative 2 times 3 minus 5 3 minus 4. 6 minus 5 is 1. 3 minus 4 is negative 1. Negative 1 over negative 1 is positive 1. So we're going to have a whole at negative 3, positive 1. Whatever we cancel out, solve for that. And that's the x value we're going to use. Plug it into this, and that will give us the y coordinate of our whole. So at negative 3, 1, we're going to have a whole. All right, so here. Our x-intercept is going to be at where 2x minus 5 equals 0. So 2x minus 5 equals 0 at 2x equals 5. x equals 5 over 2, or 2 and 1 half. That's our x-intercept. The y-intercept will be at 15 over negative 12. 
they both have a three in common. The y intercept is at negative five fourths or negative one and one fourth. Vertical asymptote. The vertical asymptote will be at x equals four. It's of the simplified version. And the horizontal asymptote will be at, since they're the same, it equals negative two. They're both x squares. So negative two over one is negative two. Well, it's negative three, so it's negative six, so it's 11 over negative seven. 11 over negative seven. So negative 11 over seven, that's where it's gonna be. All right, so let's look at all our points. X-intercept is at two and one half. Y-intercept is at negative one and one fourth. Horizontal or vertical asymptote is at four. Horizontal asymptote is at negative two. And we know we have a hole at negative three, 11 over negative seven, which is one and three, four sevenths, which is about here. So our graph on this side will look like this. Now, is it going to be above here or down here? Where's the other half of this graph? Is it going to be here or here? We know it can't be here because there's no more x-intercepts. So it's got to be here. There's the graph. A lot of moving parts. A lot more than I expected, actually. Okay, so for your homework for class tomorrow, try to finish question number 12, which is the application problem on your sheets. And for those of you in TV land, I will send it to you uh, this afternoon. That's... Five. Well, let me sh I'll show it to y'all. Here's number 12 for y'all. This is example 12. So do this for class tomorrow. Okay, then I'll see everybody tomorrow.